Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'd like to talk about um, some of our work where we are trying to uh, use physiology and more fundamental understanding to help support our, our work on fruit production and to help the industry. Um, so um, I just retired recently after over 40 years at Cornell. And so um, I'm not going to talk about all 40 years of research, but give some examples of how we uh, think that uh, more fundamental understanding in, uh, integrated with applied research has been effective to help our industry, our fruit industry. Um, so my, uh, uh, my research is uh, primarily in uh, fruit production and especially fruit physiology. Uh, we do have an excellent uh, uh, specialist on the applied uh, end that I work very closely with. Uh, and so I'm, I'm focusing on the physiology, trying to understand the factors that affect uh, the growth and development of, um, of fruit. Uh, so one of the uh, things that I'm uh, interested in doing is, I don't know if you can see this, uh, is not only working on the, uh, um, the, any given factor at any one moment, but I'm also interested in the dynamics of the system of fruit growth and development. And uh, so we're interested in how the fruit grows over the entire season, and then uh, if there's particular critical periods that we can understand and then try to use for uh, helping the growers uh, improve their practices at critical times. So we're interested in the dynamics of the system. Um, now, of course, when you begin to do this type of research, there's various approaches that you can use. And so, uh, you know, one of the questions we always ask is, what is the, what is the, the most effective approach to use? And uh, there's a, a wide range of approaches, and I sort of indicated these over the spectrum from, uh, from basic or fundamental type of research, where you're trying to look at the, uh, at the very uh, small detail level of, of how um, fruit develop, and both in the uh, uh, genetic and physiological um, approach. Uh, but also then there's a spectrum over to the applied research, working directly with growers and uh, in the field. And I think sometimes we tend to separate those types of research where really I think it's uh, most important to integrate those because uh, the, uh, the real fundamental research gives us a, a real depth of understanding as to how something is occurring and what's the uh, process that's involved and what are some of the factors that regulate those processes. But uh, processes at any one level, such as a molecular level or tissue level, cannot very well predict all the behavior at the next level above. So uh, if we go down in a uh, level to look at, uh, uh, at the, a process, we can't always predict what the uh, response will be at a higher level, such as in the, in the field, a whole plant, or uh, in a whole crop. So uh, it's very important to have an understanding of the crop and the field level because it provides a context for how uh, any given process is actually manifested in the field. Uh, because some, some of them may change, but it doesn't affect the general behavior of the, of the crop. And some of them do have a, a, a very significant effect. So, uh, so knowing and understanding the applied side is very important to provide that context. And it, it also uh, helps translate the information that we receive uh, from an in-depth fundamental type of research into uh, useful research for the field. So, uh, so we feel that, uh, that we need to uh, either ourselves or collaborate uh, as teams to work so that we can, uh, we can use fundamental molecular level tools uh, if it's appropriate for the problem and how they interact with whole plant physiology and then how that also interacts with the applied uh, work that the, uh, uh, and translating into practices for growers. So 
uh, we feel that it really needs to be integrated to be uh, most effective. And so uh, we tried to, um, to do that as much as possible. So, uh, and I'll give some examples. Uh, but so another way of looking at uh, what are good approaches is, um, looks like I'm in. <laughs> uh, I don't want to get too far from the microphone, but um, what I'd like to, uh, this is a, a figure from a presentation that uh, I think is very useful uh, in that he talks about research that uh, along the left side, research that's, um, that's inspired by fundamental understanding. So in the lower left corner, there's no, no fundamental understanding uh, versus yes in the upper left. Uh, but then to the right and left is research inspired by utility or usefulness. And so you have, a, you have four quadrants. Uh, of course, the one that has no application and no knowledge generation is, is one we obviously want to avoid. Um, there's a lot of work in the uh, area that they refer to as Niels Bohr type of work, uh, pursuit of fundamental understanding without really having any application in mind, just learning something about a system. Uh, and then the opposite would be Edison, who just did a lot of trial and error just to see what would work and what did not work, but it does not generate uh, a fundamental understanding. So, of course, I think the most useful is the uh, Pasteur's quadrant. Uh, and uh, the definition there was basically uh, the Pasteurian type of research is directed toward increasing fundamental understanding uh, in a context responsive to applied needs at levels uh, both in the problem selection and experimental design. So what we try to do is look for the principles that are involved uh, because if we understand the principle, then we can uh, better understand how a system will work in, under different conditions. So it gives us much more predictability uh, if we understand a principle than if we uh, uh, only understand a response to a treatment. So, um, so I, I try to look at understanding the physiological principles that are underlying the behavior of the, res of the plants in the field and also in response to cultural practices that the growers use, such as chemical thinning or pruning, uh, irrigation, those sorts of things. Um, I do like the quote from uh, Emerson. Uh, basically, the value of principle is in the number of things that will explain. And if you really have a good understanding of the principle of a, uh, of a system, you'll be able to explain a lot of different responses that may occur under different conditions which in a uh, trial and error type of study, you put a treatment on, one year you get one response, another year you get a different response. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if you understand the principle being, for example, water availability, in a wet year you expect a different response than in a dry year. So, um, so I think it's very important to try, uh, you know, you can do trial and error uh, research. That's, it's not that, it isn't useful, but in many, many cases we find it's, uh, it's useful to help uh, give the information that we can use to try to understand the principle. So. Okay, so in my, in my particular case, then the uh, research goals were basically to understand these environmental and physiological principles that affect the uh, growth and development, productivity, and economic yields and quality of, uh, of fruit especially apples and grapes that I work with. Uh, but also very importantly is to utilize this information uh, to work collaboratively with extension specialists, applied researchers and growers to be able to apply that research. Uh, and to me, that's, that's the impact that we're really looking for if we're working in an applied area such as fruit production. Uh, because the, uh, uh, you know, ultimately the, the public that provides our support uh, wants to see an eff effect in terms of either improving the quality of fruit or perhaps uh, reducing the cost or, 
or improving the economic uh, or the environmental effects of uh, fruit production. So uh, my particular emphases have been more in the light energy, carbon balance, and, and water relations, uh, not so much in the nutrition or, or hormone areas. So, um, so some of the uh, types of questions, I'll, uh, I'll give a, maybe three examples uh, here of the types of work that we've done that I think uh, have, been, have turned out to be quite useful. Uh, one has to do with the carbon balance of, um, in this case, apples. Uh, we were quite interested in how much dry matter do, uh, you know, the biological yield of apples, uh, how much do they produce over a season, and what are the factors of, that affect that? Uh, and, you know, what controls that, and then also how, how that is uh, distributed to the vegetative growth versus the crop. Um, and the outcome, I'll talk about that, is a, is a crop growth model, a simulation model uh, that's been uh, turned out to be quite helpful for growers for thinning. Uh, and then I'll also talk about, uh, on the water relations side, uh, how much water do apple trees in New York use? Uh, the traditional maths not work for us. So we had to uh, use some physiology to develop a, an apple-specific water use model, the penman monteith equation. Uh, and that's also turned out to be helpful for growers to be able to uh, understand the uh, requirements uh, for uh, apples and then also for irrigation. And then finally, uh, another approach is to uh, look at um, the ability to measure the water relations in our crops. Um, we, uh, we find that uh, with fruit crops, especially apples and grapes, they have root systems that can go very deep and very far, but they are not very intense. So there may be large areas that don't have any roots. And so soil moisture measurements are very difficult to use to try to estimate the stress in the plant. So we would like to be able to measure the stress directly in the plant. And after carrying a pressure bomb around uh, orchards and vineyards for about 30 or 35 years, I decided that it would be good to develop a sensor that we could hopefully put directly in the plant. So I'll talk about our, our work with that. Um, okay, so first about the, uh, uh, some of the questions that we're asking in the carbon balance area. Um, so specifically how much uh, dry matter does a, uh, an apple tree produce over the years? But you can do, you can do that with uh, just at the end of the season harvesting whole trees. But we were very interested in what were the patterns of supply and demand. Uh, we tend to talk about uh, using parameters for estimating a supply demand like leaf area per gram of fruit or these types of uh, indices, but there's never, there's never an aspect of dynamics. Uh, it's one value for the whole season, but we know that's not a constant value from time uh, over the season. So, we wanted to look at uh, what were those patterns, and this is where we began to use uh, dynamic simulation modeling. And then uh, were there, since we could model the carbon balance, whether it was excess or deficit, we, were, we wanted to ask, are there key periods during the season that there are deficits? And is there something we can do about that? Um, so uh, that's, that's sort of the approach, and ultimately we're interested in the carbon metabolism uh, available to fruit and fruit development. So um, we used two different um, integrated approaches. Um, one was to uh, uh, initially to you know, take measurements. I don't, I don't believe in just modeling because a model is a, is a hypothesis, basically. And so a hypothesis by itself without measurement is not, um, you know, is not acceptable as a final product. So uh, we wanted to take, me and we've taken many, many measurements of photosynthesis, and, uh, and in this case you can see in the, in the photograph we've used uh, whole canopy chambers, that we've been enclosed uh, entire trees so we can measure the entire tree gas exchange and not, not just single leaves, or, although we've taken many single leaf measurements too. So we've taken a lot of field measurements over the season. But if you take them on a day like today, very sunny and clear, 
Uh, we know if it's tomorrow is cloudy, it's not going to be the same. So, uh, but we can estimate what's happening in between. So we can es fill in the spaces between the measurements with uh, models that allow us to try to take uh, like snapshot photographs taken at a few times and make a video between them so that we can understand the dynamics. Um, and so we, uh, we find that they're very, uh, you need to do both of them, I think. The uh, modeling really helps integrate between the measurements that you take, but it also uh, does provide information in between. Uh, but you always have to remember models don't, don't provide answers. They only provide hypotheses. But fortunately, they're quantitative hy hypotheses if you use models. So, um, so I think it's very important that these be, uh, uh, be well integrated. And so uh, I don't have time to go into all the components, but we have a, an apple version called Malasim and then a, a grape version called Vitasim. Uh, and it basically uh, is a daily time step model that that tries to estimate uh, from leaf area and light availability what the light interception, the energy input to the tree, and then from that a uh, photosynthetic response curve so we can estimate the total photosynthesis for the day. Uh, and then we uh, subtract the, uh, the demand or the respiration that's required to maintain the plant, and then uh, uh, we compare that to the total demand for growth from the different components uh, of the tree. Uh, we do have, a, in uh, the case of the apple, we do have part uh, partitioning submodels to estimate the distribution of the dry matter into the plant and also uh, the effect of that uh, carbon available to the fruit on the drop and growth of the fruit itself. Uh, so uh, it's a relatively simple model in terms of compared to most models, but it's, it, it gets relatively complex. Uh, just quickly show you a few examples where it, we feel that it's giving uh, quite realistic uh, data. Uh, this is uh, from uh, University of Bologna, colleagues uh, working there, uh, where they were using the balloon type of system and they were using shading. So on the left, you can see where uh, it'd be the carbon carbon gain during the day uh, over different hours, and they had different shade periods. And so the, uh, the red line are the simulated values, and the uh, black line are the, um, are the actual whole tree gas exchange measurements. So uh, you can see that they're, that they're quite well correlated, so we feel uh, quite comfortable that we're getting realistic uh, data from that. Uh, and then also from another uh, study of apples in New Zealand uh, from John Palmer. Uh, on the left, you can see the light interception data, uh, you know, that, uh, that they took the measurements and the symbols and then the lines are the, uh, are the simulation based on the, uh, on the leaf area that they, uh, uh, that they provided. So again, I think we're fairly realistic. And then the simulated versus measured dry matter production over a, an entire season uh, looks very good. Um, and uh, so we're, again, fairly comfortable that, that we're not generating you know, crazy values with this. So when we put this together to sort of look to see if there was a particular time period that was a, a problem, uh, it became quite clear that if you look at the, um, the supply uh, from, the, from the canopy for fruit development, uh, and then compare it, which is in, in blue, uh, and you compare that to the demands of different levels of crop. Uh, so the, uh, the red shows the demand for a crop which would be normal for the orchard that we're, that we're simulating. And you can see that it, it basically stays in fairly, fairly good balance, uh, except in New York, uh, you know, it gets quite a bit colder in the late season, so our supply drops off and we, we may not reach the full sizing. It, it slows down some at the end of the season. Um, and a heavy crop, which, which we defined in our case as a crop which the maximum crop that orchard had produced 
over several years. Uh, so when we put that in, we see again it, uh, uh, it it's not fully supported during the most of the season, but during the early part of the season, it's it's fairly close to balance. Um, now, in in purple, the one that goes directly up is um, what the demand would be if all the fruits that began to grow stayed on the tree. And you can see from that that uh, shortly after bloom, that demand exceeds the supply dramatically, and so. Uh, it's quite clear that uh, although late in the season you may have some, some decline in the uh, support or adequate support for uh, growth, it's really that period uh, in the first, um, roughly from about a week after bloom to about three weeks after bloom is the most critical time uh, for fruit uh, development. And uh, we've also found that if you do shading studies at that time or photosynthesis inhibitors, uh, you know, it's very consistent with a carbon deficit uh, at that time. Uh, and what happens is if you have inadequate carbon supply, uh, the fruit slow down in their growth. And so uh, we looked at many, probably 10,000 fruits by monitoring their growth rate uh, over time. And we found that uh, that there's a, a general relationship. Uh, it varies a little bit with variety and stage of development, but basically the fastest growing fruit are retained on the tree. Those are the ones that re stay there until harvest. But if the fruit slow their growth rate down, and these are for maybe two, two to three day periods, if they slow their growth rate down, the percentage of them that drop goes up dramatically. And so if you have fruit that are growing at 20% of the maximum growth rate at that time under those conditions, uh, almost all of those are going to fall. They're all abscising. Uh, they may be on the tree, but they're not growing, and then it may take a week or 10 days to actually fall off the tree. So we found this general pattern to be very, very consistent, and we actually are using this as a bioassay for chemical thinning. Uh, responses. If, you, the, monitor, if the uh, growers, they monitor the fruit growth and when they put their chemical thinner on, then they can monitor for five days afterwards and uh, see what the uh, percent growth rate is, uh, what the distribution from uh, growth rates. And we have a very simple equation where they can then calculate what percentage of the fruit are going to fall off a week or 10 days later. And this allows them, if, if they did not thin very well, it allows them to be able to put a, a, an additional treatment on before the fruit is no longer sensitive. Uh, so this has been very helpful as a bioassay of, of the response to chemical thinning. Okay. Um, um, in, uh, when I was here in 2009, um, I was here just about the time that there was a, uh, a very, very large drop occurring in apples. And uh, so Roberto said, <laughs> let's go out to the orchard. And, and uh, we, we looked and uh, we could see that there were a, an abnormally large amount of fruit that were initially set and continued to develop. And then there was a very, very heavy drop of fruit. And so, uh, so we said, well, let's, let's just uh, look, the carbon, carbon balance, these models are, uh, they're not necessarily always the problem, but they may be the problem. And so uh, since we can model it, we look to see if, if this seems to be a, an issue. And so in this case, um, we look at the uh, graph, we can see that the line in the middle is basically perfect balance between supply and demand. So. Anything above that will be excess carbon, so no limitation on fruit development. And below that is a carbon deficit. And normally, uh, based on the model, that uh, bar below there is sort of the threshold that we begin to see significant drop problems. So if it's above that, there's some variation, but it's, it doesn't cause a major effect. So the two things that we saw uh, just from this uh, model was that uh, after bloom, during that critical period, we had an exceptionally good P 
period, probably like uh, today, or maybe not even this warm, uh, but very, very good carbon balance conditions, which I think allowed so many of the fruit to continue to grow. And so they stayed on the tree, and then the demand was really increasing at a time that there was about six days of very low light uh, that occurred. And normally when you have six very cloudy days, it's not something that is very noticeable. I mean, you may think, but, it, but you don't think of it as being uh, extremely detrimental to a tree. And yet, at the, just at the wrong time, it could have a very dramatic effect. So it appeared from this uh, model that it could be helpful to look at natural drop conditions. And so um, we wanted to, uh, to see what was happening with the, uh, the effect of low light. Um, and so one of the approaches that we used was to work with our uh, genomics uh, colleague, uh, Su Shen Gan, in, uh, uh, on the main campus in Ithaca, where we looked, we uh, imposed uh, shade over trees, and we monitored the fruit growth and development. And then uh, after 24 and 72 hours, we collected fruit and determined the, uh, the use subtractive hybridization to look for specific genes that would be either up or down regulated by the, by the shade to see if there was particular metabolic patterns that correlated with the, uh, uh, with the actual growth responses. Now, one of the issues is that at the beginning, uh, with no treatment, if you actually look at the, the uh, growth rate of a population of fruit, which we did, we measured the fruit before we put any treatment on. And what we found was that if you look at the percent of fruit that fell into different growth rate categories, uh, we s this is very typical for that, that period when you're seeing a lot of drop, and that is that you have a group of fruit to the right that show sort of a normal distribution of growth rate, and then you have another group that are basically not growing, but they're still on the tree. And, it's, and if they've just stopped growing, then uh, you may have a, uh, um, you know, they may still appear to be normal. Uh, so, when you have a distribution like this, um, what, we, what we found from monitor, continuing to monitor those fruits that we didn't sample, um, we could see that, uh, that the fruits that were, had the higher growth rates, as we said, re were retained on the tree, and the ones that had the very low growth rates were all going to fall off. But they had a low growth rate for some other reason, not our treatment. So it really, um, it brings up a, a very important question, I think, for a lot of the uh, molecular studies that we're trying to address, and that is, what do you sample? How do you, because if you take a random sample without knowing the growth history of the fruit, you're going to get some of those that, you know, in a fairly, they can be a fairly high percentage of the fruit, are ones that have stopped growing earlier for another reason, which is not related to your treatment. So it, it begins to confuse what, uh, what may be happening in terms of, say, gene expression, uh, because you're not, you're not seeing the fruit that were normal before the treatment. Um, and also, um, uh, things like metabolomics, again, I think the dynamics is important, not just, because uh, metabolomics, you know, whether, uh, by whatever method, is a, um, we say a snapshot, it's one time you take a sample and you determine, for example, the uh, level of carbohydrate, you know, soluble carbohydrates in the fruit. And we did that with some other, uh, with a related study uh, of um, uh, low light effects. And what we found is in the fruit that were not growing at all, they had exactly the same amount of soluble sugar as the fruit that were growing very rapidly. So from a metabolomic standpoint, we could not determine whether they were actively growing or whether they were physiologically dead. Uh, it was the, it's the flux of metabolites that's important because the ones that were growing were bringing in a lot of carbohydrates, but we're using them. 
And so they didn't accumulate, they were utilizing. And the ones that were, had stopped growing weren't importing anymore, but they still had some in the, in the cells. So again, I think the uh, dynamics of the system is something that we don't always really appreciate, and I think it can cause real problems of interpretation. So, uh, so what we did in these cases is we, when we put the treatments on, we also did a study with benzaladenine, a chemical, um, is that we, uh, we had monitored the uh, fruit. And so the ones that were on the left side that were not growing or growing very slowly, we knew those were abnormal and were not, uh, would normally not be showing much of a response Anyway, so we uh, specifically eliminated those. And then we sampled from the, uh, uh, from the group that was closest to the mean. Uh, so I think we could stratify our samples so that we had a much cleaner separation between them. And then we could look at the, uh, at the results. And so I won't go into all the results primarily because I don't, I don't understand that uh, you know, method that well. But uh, but basically, the, uh, uh, this is the, some of the functional classification of uh, genes that were affected. And carbon, uh, carbohydrate metabolism was one of the major things that was affected. This is at 24 hours after the beginning of the, of the treatment. And then, um, and then at, at 72 hours, it was even more important. But interestingly, uh, um, at 24 hours, we saw no... Uh, no change or no significant changes in the ethylene genes. It was only at 72 hours that we say, saw the ACC oxidase upregulated, which suggests to us that the carbon metabolism is the first part that's slowing down and that the ethylene is probably a secondary part of the cascade of effects that occurs after the, uh, after the initial uh, reduction. And there's been further uh, uh, studies on... Uh, on gene expression that's suggesting that, uh, that a lot of the genes with uh, cell, um, in the cell production cycle are being uh, significantly reduced by, uh, by shade. And um, so we're, we're hoping, we did not, we were not able to get a lot of funding for this, but uh, we're hoping that these types of studies might be able to help integrate uh, why there are so many different things that can cause fruit to drop uh, water stress, nutrient stress, carbon stress, uh, different pesticides, different hormones cause the fruit to drop, and yet they should, they seem to have different mechanisms. So that suggests that there's probably a very central, something like cell production uh, cycle that may be the central integrating mechanism uh, between these. And if that's the case, then we may be able to look for molecular markers so that we put a treatment on and perhaps 24 hours later, take a sample and look for those markers to tell us whether the fruit will abscise or uh, remain on the tree. Uh, so this particular study then, uh, we found that the shade reduced the growth and drop as we'd seen before, um, and that it was the carbohydrate metabolism that seemed to be the strongest uh, response time and that the ethylene uh, genes seem to occur at a later stage. Um, and that interestingly, sorbitol 6-phosphate dehydrogenase uh, gene uh, was upregulated in, uh, in the fruit, even though it was not believed to be expressed in young fruit. Uh, so uh, you know, these types of studies were very helpful. But uh, being integrated with our growth and physiology studies, I think, uh, helped uh, improve both. Uh, both types of, uh, of the research. Um, and uh, so all in all, the metabolic or the gen gene expression responses were very consistent with carbon starvation. Uh, and there's been other studies with other plants that, that show these types of patterns of response to uh, lack of carbon and uh, supporting uh, the growth. Okay, so uh, those helped really uh, give us a much better understanding of uh, of the whole system. And then we wanted to say, okay, now how can we use that to help growers? And uh, one of the things that uh, my colleague, Terrence Robinson, who was here a while ago, uh, had been doing was uh, putting uh, chemical thinning treatments on about every four days after bloom. 
uh, throughout the entire thinning and early growth and drop period. And he found, uh, as those that work on apples will know, you can do the same thing year after year after year and you'll get different results. Sometimes the strongest effect is early and sometimes the strongest effect is later. Uh, and uh, of course the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So we thought, well, we need to try to see if we can overcome this insanity by uh, understanding it better. So um, Terence asked, you know, could we compare our models to these patterns of, of uh, response to chemical thinners? And we did find that uh, uh, this is just one, one year, he's got 12 or 13 years now, uh, that if we had a very, very significant carbon deficit period that occurred just after the treatment, we would see a much stronger response to the chemical thinner. So the, the uh, poor carbon deficit interacted, and, or I guess it would be additively with the effect of the, of the chemical thinner. And of course the opposite would be if you had very, very good conditions, the chemical thinner works less. And this is very consistent with general observations as well. So um, we began to use this in, in a, uh, in a general way for the growers, and it would be similar to um, like using the uh, penman monteith equation to estimate water evapotranspiration uh, from crops. And they use a standard grass, a defined uh, uh, set of parameters for a standard grass, and then you enter the weather data to see what, uh, what the reference water use would be from this standard, uh, and then you can adjust uh, to your specific crop. So we, we uh, basically use a similar approach. We use a standard tree and we put in the weather data and use the Malison model to estimate sort of a carbon reference. Um, and so Terence began to use this. Um, he would run the model and then uh, uh, with some forecast weather data, which turns out to be one of the real weaknesses of the uh, uh, the method, not, not the model, uh, but because uh, the model may be fine, but if you put in data that doesn't turn out to be correct, that can be a, a, a problem. But, uh, so we have to use some forecast data, which is unfortunate. But, um, so he would uh, take the data and then take the best forecast and run the carbon balance model and then talk to the growers or send out information to the growers and initially he, he said that uh, it would be uh, you know, something that would be sort of general advice. Like this model suggests that, that the trees may be extra sensitive. So uh, perhaps the grower should reduce the concentration. And so that was how it began. And it, it turned out to be very effective for the growers. Uh, in one year where there was a very significant deficit Actually, in 2010, uh, they were, um, after a couple years of, of this, they were convinced that they should uh, reduce their chemical thinning. And compared to those that, uh, that did not, they, uh, they got very good results versus over thinning in the, in the, using the standard concentration. And they estimated that it saved the industry um, probably $10 million in that one year uh, just by having this type of data. And we have a fairly large grower that uh, feels he's probably averaged 100 to $150,000 per year increase in uh, profitability by having this type of additional information that he can integrate with his own. Uh, so uh, then all the growers wanted this. So instead of having to do that all ourselves, uh, then we, uh, we worked with a climate center that was collecting data from different weather stations in New York. and. Uh, to uh, have the model online. So now the growers can go in and on the map they can select their weather station. It's best for them. And they put in their a green tip at the beginning of growth. So they put the date to start the model. And, uh, and then it, it automatically takes the data from there and uh, presents the temperatures and the solar radiation data. And then it gives uh, an estimate of the production demand and. Uh, and balance 
uh, and then a four-day running average of, of that balance. And, um, and then as it gets close to the thinning period, then Terence has evolved uh, knowing that certain levels of carbon deficit will mean that you should reduce the, carb, uh, the concentration of the chemical thinner by 50% or 25% or don't change it or maybe increase it. Um, so he has a thinning recommendation that goes along with that. And the growers have been using that and been you know, very, very, uh, very happy with the, with the results. And it does provide a little more uh, physiological basis based on the principles of response to allow them to make an appropriate adaptation in, in their treatments depending on what the weather has been or and is proposed to be. Okay, uh, And we're now trying to figure out there's growers all over the world that want, you know, want to use this and uh, uh, unfortunately our, our climate people can't <laughs> take the world's climate and do this for everybody. So, so that's the next, next um, challenge that we have trying to figure out how to make this available for more people. So, um, as I mentioned, another, uh, another example is in the area of, uh, of water, water use, water relations of uh, apples. Um, what we were finding is that uh, when we took, the normal method was the Penman-Monteith reference uh, evapotranspiration, and then you adjust it by what's called a crop coefficient. So if the, if the grass is going to use, a, you, know, a, you know, 100 liters of water in that day uh, from uh, irrigation areas like California or Australia, they developed relationships uh, to that, to that uh, reference. So they would say in the middle of the season, maybe apple tree would use 90% of that. Uh, so, we uh, would take the ETO, we calculate by the 90% and do our irrigation. And it turned out we were giving the trees too much water. So uh, we found in the literature, there was a study that basically showed that for tall crops in humid climates, which of course is what apple trees uh, in New York and here uh, would be, that using that crop coefficient is not correct uh, because there's some other factors that are uh, that are not fitting the way it, they do in uh, arid climates. So we're trying to understand why and, uh, and that also I had, I had noticed um, in many studies over the years about uh, the stomatal behavior of, of apples that they did not behave like most plants. There's a very unusual response curve. So, um, so I, uh, we wanted to see if that could be part of the, uh, the issue and I'll, I'll show you that response curve in just a moment. Uh, but the approach we use uh, was first of all to, uh, to get a grad student who understood environmental physics. And uh, I didn't need a horticulturist. We needed an environmental physicist. And fortunately, we, uh, we found an excellent one um, in uh, a fellow. Oops. OK, do I, do I need to? Do I need to back up? I'm not sure. OK, well, um, OK, so the, uh, the question then about uh, why, why don't apples use as much uh, water as we expect them to, um, we, uh, I got a, a very good grad student, Daniela Dragoni, who's an uh, environmental physicist. And so he could go out and do all the uh, microclimatology studies and determining aerodynamic resistances and these sorts of things. Uh, but the, uh, the way we actually measured it, we wanted to measure it directly. We didn't want to just depend on the model. Uh, again, measurements are the reality. So we used a sap flow method uh, where we put uh, a heater, uh, like a needle with a heater, and then uh, sensors above and below with temperature sensors so that we could turn on the heat and increase the uh, temperature of the water in the xylem for just one second. And it, so it's a, a pulse of heat. And then that moves up, and we can measure that temperature as it goes by the, by the uh, thermocouples above that point. And that tells us the velocity of water flow. Uh, now, velocity is not the same as volume. 
Uh, so, um, and there's some calculations that people use with SAP flow gauges that I did not really believe. So, uh, so we put in the SAP flow gauges and then we measured the whole trees with the balloons to actually do a direct calibration of the SAP flow gauges, none of which were actually accurate with the standard method. Uh, and then we removed the balloons and let the sap flow measurements under natural conditions for the rest of the season. Uh, so we were able to get the actual data. So uh, uh, here's just an example of, uh, this is the crop coefficient uh, over a period during the summer. And the, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but the, the solid black line near the top is the actual measured crop coefficient. What percentage of the uh, the reference ET was actually used by the trees. And you can see from day to day, it went from about 0.4 or 0.5 up to about 1.1. And uh, so it, uh, you know, there's, uh, you could sort of see a general pattern there, but um, what, what happened was on sp certain days, uh, cool sunny days, the tree would use much less than the grass uh, referred to. If it was very hot and sunny, like in California, you, you had a good estimation. <laughs> but if it was cool and sunny, and uh, we, were wonder we uh, tried to figure out why that was the case, because some years we have a lot of cool, sunny weather, and we would over-irrigate uh, dramatically. So it turns out in apple orchards, the, uh, because of the tall, rough structure, Air mixes extremely well around. So uh, if, the, uh, if the stomates on the plant open up and the, you, know, you have a high transpiration because the humidity is removed. And it also is very sensitive to the general humidity and vapor pressure deficit of the air. Uh, and then of course, everything is driven by radiation. That's the energy. Uh, so in apples, we know that uh, uh, radiation is important, uh, the stomatal opening is important, and also the, the vapor pressure, the humidity, general humidity is important. Uh, so stomatal behavior is very important, controlling uh, water use in apples. Now grass, which uh, is this reference, uh, you can see in the, in the photograph I put a little dashed line to uh, refer to, it has a very, very a uh, still layer of air. There's a heavy boundary layer of air over grass, and especially in orchards and vineyards, because you, you have every, you know, three meters or so, you have a windbreak. <laughs> so uh, the wind doesn't move through the grass uh, like it does through the tops of the trees. So there's a heavy layer of uh, air. If the stomates in the grass or the cover crops open, it cannot get out of that uh, boundary layer rapidly. So if the stomates open, it makes the air more humid. And that counterbalances or cancels the effect of the stomate, stomate opening and closing. So what happens is that uh, the, uh, re, uh, the grass basically is driven only by radiation. So now the grass, one model is a grass driven by radiation, and the, but the tree is driven by radiation, stomatal conductance, and humidity. Uh, so if you actually take the calculated uh, uh, reference ET, um, well, 94% of the variation is explained by radiation only. Uh, and we, uh, and, but we have, we have a big variation in, in climate like you do here. And so sometimes uh, we have high radiation, but cool, humid, conditions. And under those conditions, we see a big, uh, you know, a, a large difference in the actual water use. Um, now, I mentioned just, uh, just from many, many uh, years of, of being interested in how plants grow, uh, not necessarily that I, it would lead to irrigation uh, estimates, but, uh, but I was interested in what's controlling stomatal behavior. Uh, in plants because I was also interested in photosynthesis and the stomate, uh, the CO2 going in. So one of the things that we, we noticed is that uh, when we would determine a, uh, 
uh, uh, response between the leaf conductance and the vapor pressure deficit, or the humidity, so on the left side would be very humid conditions versus dry on the right. Uh, what we found was that over a fairly large range, the stomates did not respond to the humidity in the air, which is fairly unusual because most plants, as it gets drier, the stomates respond and close, which is like uh, that dashed line of VPD limit. Um, uh, that's what normally happens and actually happens in apples if you put them in glass houses or you grow them in very humid places like England uh, uh, where there's no stress at all on them. But if you, if you have them under normal field conditions where there is some stress, we find that, uh, that the actual response is one of those red lines and that there's actually two limiting factors. For the, uh, for the behavior of the uh, stomates. Um, and one is that uh, they really can't open more than the humidity would allow. So if it's extremely dry, that becomes a controlling factor. But if it's humid, the stomates don't respond to the humidity anymore. They're controlled by a very tight coupling to the photosynthesis of the leaf. And of course, that can go up and down depending on varying different conditions. Uh, such as uh, crop level. If you remove the crop and the carbohydrates accumulate, the photosynthesis will go down and the stomates will close. So uh, trees in the middle of the season that we've removed all the fruit, they may have 10% of, uh, five to 10% of the, of the transpiration that normal trees do, that would have a normal crop. So the factors, so it, um, the actual response curve depends on, uh, on the photosynthesis rate as well as the humidity. So uh, this is quite a unique response curve, but we found that we had to use that to uh, develop a, uh, a model that actually fit the, the measurement data. Uh, so uh, what we did then was to, uh, to take, in this case, uh, use the normal, um, the normal response curve, which is this middle one, and, uh, and we put that into the model, and we, we took the Penman-Monteith equation, which is good. It takes into account all the physics and, of the system, but we said rather than modeling grass and then trying to compare it to apple, let's just model apple. So we have an apple-specific Penman-Monteith equation, and when we put in that unusual stomatal behavior, you can see on the right that the observed and modeled data uh, was very, very close. And so we've found that we can, uh, uh, we then have taken that again with the, with the climate people and they can go in, select their weather station similarly. And, um, and then it, um, you know, we have to describe the orchard and give information there. And then, uh, and then we estimate the, uh, the orchard evapotranspiration and then do a water balance uh, for the growers to be able to uh, make adjustments. And if we have a cool sunny year, you know, we may use 40% less water than, uh, than the standard method would have said. So, uh, and of course you don't want to overwater and have a lot of leaching of nutrients into the groundwater and, uh, and uh, things like that. So it's, um, that's something that's been very, uh, uh, very useful for our growers as well. And again, a lot of the key was some fundamental understanding of the behavior of stomates uh, that really uh, was able to m make this an accurate method. Okay, and the third one, or if we have some time, um, is that, um, as I mentioned, I dragged around a pressure bomb. I don't know, have you all carried a pressure bomb around a, <laughs> anywhere? If you have, you're all uh, very interested in not doing that anymore. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I was interested in was uh, how do we do this more automatically? Uh, and uh, also when you're doing pressure bomb readings, normally you're comparing treatments. Uh, and so to do that, you have to do that under very uniform conditions like today. Well, if the rest of the week is not, not those conditions, then you don't have a very accurate uh, sample of the, of the dynamics of the week. So, uh, of course, you can try to measure water 
in the soil, uh, but you can see from the different types of uh, soils, you get different root distributions, and uh, so we found soil to be uh, not a very effective way. It can be in some cases, but many times. We really want to measure the plant. Uh, so so what, we, uh, what we came up with was the idea of taking a, uh, a tensiometer. This is a standard soil, classic tensiometer, uh, that uh, you have a permeable exchange through the ceramic tip uh, with the soil. And as the soil pulls water out of the, uh, the tube is capped, so there's uh, air cannot get in, and then we have a pressure gauge. And so if the water is pulled out by soil that's drier than the gauge, then it sets up a tension on the water, and you measure that tension. Um, the problem with this is that it, it, uh, it fails. You get air into the system uh, in a, a quite small range. It's about less than one bar of tension. And that's similar to going from, say, full wet field capacity to moist soil. So it, it has some range, but it's not as large a range as, as we uh, uh, would normally like to have. So our idea is to take that and make a little computer chip, uh, basically a, a chip uh, that we could embed directly into the trunk of the tree or vine. Uh, it can also be used for soil, but, uh, but you know, my dream was to stick it inside the trunk and be able to take continuous measurements of the, the water potential in the, in the plant. So um, I worked together with a, uh, uh, it's called microfluidics. Uh, they're basic little chips that have channels uh, or vessels that actually have liquid in them. Uh, they have some uh, PCR chips, I think, uh, now that, uh, uh, that, you know, the liquids flow through it and, uh, over a temperature gradient to do cycling. Uh, and so we worked with um, this engineer who's really a brilliant uh, young scientist. And so we uh, developed what's called a, a MEMS. It's Microelectromechanical Systems. Um, and it's, it's basically, um, it's the next generation after uh, like a computer chip, a normal, a normal integrated circuit. It's a chip with a circuit, electrical circuit on it. Uh, MEMS devices are integrated devices. So it might have something with a switch. It might have something with a motor in it. Uh, you know, a variety of things. Uh, could be an entire camera, for example. Uh, so these are integrated devices. And so, uh, but they're produced in chip type robotic factories. Uh, and they're produced on, uh, you know, large large number on uh, wafers, so the, the cost of production can be quite low. So um, in this case, uh, we would have, these are uh, silicon wafers. It's actually silicon and glass are bonded together. Um, and it's a uh, small chip. Uh, it's currently, well, I have one. Where did I put it? I don't know. It's somewhere in my briefcase. I have one if you want to look at it, but it's basically, uh, basically like your fingernail. Uh, so it's very thin, about the size of a thickness of a leaf, a couple of hundred microns. And uh, uh, so at the, uh, at the bottom right, you can see the, the diagram. So this actually has water in it. Uh, there's a glass uh, layer at the bottom. And then there's a silicon um, layer at the top. And there's a, a pressure transducer that's been built right into the silicon. And so um, if water is, you know, is tried to be pulled out of the system, it will deform and there's a piezo resistors that will change the resistance of that. Uh, so we can measure that very easily. That was standard. Um, and then uh, the, uh, this sort of red layer in between is the exchange surface. And uh, so it has, uh, we've, we've had to work to make uh, the silicon porous. So it's like a sponge, a lot of gaps. But these are uh, two to five micro, uh, nanometer, excuse me, pores. So they have a very, very strong resistance to air moving in. So it gives us uh, a, uh, a very, very large range where a soil tensiometer fails with less than a bar. 
Um, we've calibrated this against the equation of state for water um, up to um, almost 200 bars. And uh, we've had some of them go over 300 bars before that was failure. Uh, so we have a dramatic increase in the, in the range and resistance to failure uh, in these. And we are currently working on uh, uh, developing all the environmental protection. Uh, electronics don't like to live in soil, wet soil, and, and things like that. So um, it's a challenge to have a sensor that must interact with the environment, but not be, harm, not be corroded by the environment. So we're working on that, and both in soils, and uh, we're looking to uh, insert them uh, into plants to be able to give us continuous uh, readout. And we have, uh, we have growers that are going to be helping, helping us test these um, in terms of monitoring those and, and in grapes, uh, making wines from different treatments to, uh, to see the significance of, the, of that. So we're hoping that uh, uh, putting them inside woody plants will be uh, a big step forward. Uh, also, in annuals, um, these we hope they'll be uh, less expensive, much less expensive than most um, soil moisture monitoring systems. Uh, many of them that measure, they don't measure the water potential, but they measure the content of soil water, and uh, they may be six thousand dollars. And uh, we're hoping that these will be something like one hundred dollars uh, instead. So uh, hopefully, much cheaper and. Uh, and be able to, to get a lot. And then they can connect to uh, wireless systems or, um, or a variety of communication uh, methods. So we're really hoping that this will help uh, uh, allow growers, for example, uh, red wine grape growers really want to, they need to regulate stress. They don't want to eliminate it or have too much. They need to have a certain amount of stress. And uh, so they would like to be able to put away the pressure bomb and, uh, and monitor this continuously. Uh, but then also uh, annual crop growers are needing to, um, um, to monitor the water stress, um, the soil moisture, because it's a better, for annuals, it's a better measurement of stress. And it also, uh, uh, annuals are, take up so much uh, space, or so many hectares, that uh, the potential savings in water could be you know, very large. And that's a real issue now. So, so those are th three examples of, of how we try to use a variety of techniques uh, to address these problems and uh, try to attack uh, different approaches. But you know, see where we can try to integrate with whatever uh, the key uh, approaches are. So I just have a few. Um, if it's not too long, I have a few sort of more philosophical things. You know, lessons that were learned over over many years. Um, and that is that, uh, uh, it's interesting, the, the things that have had the biggest impact, or hopefully will, um, are, um, are things that came from research that really dealt with uh, uh, trying to get a fundamental understanding, but the integrated nature of the, of the plant, from the molecular all the way to the, uh, the whole plant and the crop uh, system. Uh, but how it behaves in the natural environment. Um, and, uh, and then also how cultural practices uh, affect uh, these sorts of things. So it's really a, a broad view uh, of um, you know, the types of, of work that needs to be done. Uh, in some cases, uh, they did not have a specific outcome in mind. Um, that differs, uh, to me, a little bit di different than that early slide about uh, Niels Bohr. And, uh, I'm, not, I'm not looking at something just because uh, you know, it's interesting or whatever. I, I might be, like with the stomates, I didn't know what the application was, but I knew stomates were important to a, to a system. So I think if you understand the system, you know where the potentials are to be, take a better fundamental understanding and have it be useful later, uh, rather than say, just selecting a, uh, a particular uh, enzyme or something like that. So, um, but the other, the other thing that was, uh, was interesting is that I look back, I almost never received any grant funds 
for any of the work that's having a significant effect. Uh, almost a, neg a direct negative correlation between the funding I've got and the, uh, the, the uh, actual impact of the research. Uh, now, we, we did just in the last few years have gotten funding for the, uh, for the microsense, microtensiometer work. Um, okay. Um, okay, um, and just a few other things, and several of these came from, uh, um, from other colleagues uh, that I'd like to pass on, but um, I think one of, the, one of the real key things is um, take some time to do something that's just really interesting to you. Uh, not necessarily, and many times you won't get a grant for it because no one else thinks it's interesting. But something that's just, it's, it's either a problem that bothers you and you just, you know, you just have to keep working on that or something that's just extra fascinating. And that level of passion and interest that you have and many times may end up being the most valuable contribution in the, in the long run uh, because it really takes passion to, uh, uh, to work through a lot of these difficult problems. And uh, you know, if you stop thinking about it when you go home at five o'clock, you're probably not going to make a huge impact uh, compared to those that are, you're always thinking about it. It's always in the background. And uh, because you begin to see relationships uh, that you don't expect. Uh, some colleagues that made some big progress in pheromones uh, turned out, he, I asked him, where'd you get this key idea? And he said, uh, oh, at a reception for young scientists, you know, young faculty, and a person was uh, in uh, engineering. But he was working with a biosensor for chemical uh, analyses. And then that triggered an idea that eventually led to a a real breakthrough. So I think that passion and enthusiasm uh, is important. Uh, and like the, especially in science, the bottom one from Win uh, Winston Churchill, uh, I think success is the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. And uh, that pretty well sums up uh, research. Um, the other one is that um, our colleague Nelson Schallis, viticulturist, was always quite annoyingly many times always saying, well, what exactly do you mean? Or what are the units that you're talking about? And he really impressed on us that so many times we really are not precise in our thinking and our language. That too many times we use, especially in horticulture, we use these concepts like competition and, and quality and vigor. And when you start asking people, what are the what are the units that you're using there? And they begin to realize they don't have any because they don't really know what they're uh, saying. Uh, so it really, really helps to really force yourself to think, uh, think uh, more precisely about what exactly you're saying. Um, one of my favorite ones is competition. They say, well, competition between this and that. Well, competition only occurs when some resource is limiting. And you say, well, what's the resource that's limiting? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, or they guess, and then you say, well, do you have any evidence that the resource is actually limiting? And, well, no, and uh, so, um, so I think just more precise thinking. And one of, the, one of the aspects about more precise thinking that I think is really important and especially useful for students, uh, well, all of us, is to do some modeling. And preferably modeling that actually, uh, that you actually put in numeric values. Because what happens is when you first make a diagram, so like in this case we're saying, we're interested in the effect of this, this little disgusting bug, uh, European red mite. Um, and we knew that European red mite could affect fruit growth, but it didn't, it didn't affect the growth directly. It didn't affect the fruit. It reduced photosynthesis of the leaves, which would reduce the carbon supply available for fruit growth. Um, and so it may reduce fruit growth. But there's other things that affect the carbon supply and the amount of demand for that carbon. And so when you do that, you start saying, well, oh, the training system will affect the amount of light that can be intercepted. And so that affects photosynthesis as well as the bug. And uh, then 
depending on your vegetative growth, it may take some of the carbon. Uh, but the demand of the crop, if you have very few fruit, you may have a reduced carbon supply, but you still have plenty and you get full-size fruit. So when you start uh, doing these uh, diagrams, you can see, well, the demand of the crop depends on the flowering, and that depends on what, hap what you did last year. So um, what you begin to see is that there's relationships, like with the arrows shown there, that there's a relationship between what you did last year and the, and the response of the tree to the bug this year. So, um, you know, without actually drawing that diagram, it, it, that's something that you would not normally think, think about. So even qualitative diagrams like this can be very helpful. Uh, but if you actually try to make them into a mathematical model, it forces you to be quantitative. And it forces you to be sure what the units are. And I think that's an extremely good exercise because it forces you to say, well, oh, the uh, light interception affects carbon supply. Well, exactly how does it do it? Because the, you have to put in a response. And it makes you think about, well, what is that response? And how does training system maybe affect that response? Because, um, you know, a lot of times, I don't think most people would think that if you have one training system, you do not need to spray for the bug. You have a different training system you should spray, you know, for the same number of bugs. Uh, so um, I, I think these types of uh, exercises are particularly good. And of course, if we're going to look at climate change, future changes, we can't, we can't do that uh, experimentally, except in a few ways like free air, CO2 enrichment. That, but that, that's only for CO2. So you know, we have to use models in the, in the future. Uh, another, oops, yeah, sorry. Another um, thing that I've seen a, a, a concern, again, especially in, uh, in horticulture, but I imagine probably true in others, and that is that when, uh, especially with students, you know, say, well, what's your hypothesis? And they develop a hypothesis, and then they say, okay, that's like, that's my baby. I, I want, you know, and they want the hypothesis to be correct because they developed it, they want it, you know, they want it to work. And so they sort of get in the habit of doing experiments or selecting data that supports the hypothesis where we should be doing exactly the opposite. And so as uh, this philosopher said uh, that science was a, a method of bold conjectures or hypotheses along with genius, ingenious, and severe attempts to refute them, to prove that they're not correct. And if you, uh, if you do a, every experiment that you can possibly think of to disprove a hypothesis, and if you cannot, you probably have a really good hypothesis there. Uh, but too many times I see, uh, you know, when we review with grad students and, or papers uh, where they basically selected the the study or the, or the data to prove a hypothesis rather than to disprove it. So, um, and of course you want to support, you know, and if the data supports it, yes, you want to uh, report that. But anyway, so we really should be our strongest critic for our own work and, uh, and try to be critical. So, uh, and then just a couple more, just the, that team research is really critical. All the simple, problems have been solved. Now we're, you know, we're dealing with really complex issues. And so um, it's really important to have colleagues that want to work together, like Terrence Robinson. I worked a lot with Dave Eisenstadt on root growth and development. And, uh, Abe Struck is our engineer. Uh, Martin Goffinet, anatomy, uh, morphology over the years. I've got several others that uh, obviously I couldn't put all of them in. And then also to have a uh, um, it's really important to have um, excellent team members of technical people that you work with uh, that can, uh, can carry out those things and understand and they, they have an equal passion for that. Uh, and then also the students and the visiting scientists. I've been very fortunate over the years to, I think we counted up, we've had just uh, 40 international visiting scientists and students. And, they really added tremendously to the, uh, uh, to the project. So um, 
For the future, I think uh, understanding crop physiology to improve uh, practice will continue to be important. Um, models will be increasingly important uh, to integrate those things. And that um, there'll be new tools, not only biological tools, but things like uh, you know, drones and remote sensing, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, but many of them are indirect measurements. They're looking at the reflectance of a plant. That's not the same as photosynthesis. So there's really a need that, uh, uh, that these things need to be ground truth. We need to take the physiological measurements to make sure that what we think is, is being measured is actually there. Um, and of course, the uh, food industry, uh, more and more over the years, is demanding environmental footprints, carbon footprints, these sorts of things. And, uh, um, and we need the physiology understanding to be able to, uh, um, in many cases, not, not necessarily do them, but to find out whether those are correct, because a lot of people just generate footprints and, uh, and estimates, water, water use footprints and things, uh, and they don't really understand. So uh, I think for the industry, it'll be important to have physiologically sound estimates. And then uh, I think physiomics is, a, is an omic that most people uh, haven't really thought about. But it's really the, uh, it's, you know, it's the whole of the, f of the fluxes of things, uh, and the dynamics of a system. So like I mentioned, you can have, you can have the same level of sugar in, in two fruits, one of which is growing very rapidly, another one which is not growing at all. It's going to fall. Uh, so uh, the, uh, I think the dynamics of physiological processes is the, uh, is the key. And of course, we've been thinking that all along, but now we have a, a name for it, physiomics. So, uh, uh, but I think that's the level that we need to you know, be th thinking about uh, from a, a broad viewpoint. So, um, so I, think, I think the new tools, uh, can help, I mean, a variety of biological or, or environmental physical tools. Um, but I think it, they really need to be in, evaluated in terms of the context of the whole plant uh, behavior, because that's what growers are working with. They're working with the whole plant. Um, and so uh, we need ultimately to uh, get to that same level if they're going to be able to, to do something. So. Um, in any case, there's a lot, of, a lot of new tools and information technology, you know, geographic information systems and the GPS systems. Um, and so I think we can integrate those things. And so an example would be the microtensiometer to, water, to monitor the stress in the plant. That would be connected to a wireless network, which would upload the data to a GIS center. And the GIS center would then use physiological models to say this level of, of water potential is going to cause a 50% reduction in, in the shoot growth, for example. Uh, but another portion might have a better water status and it might have 100% of shoot growth. And then those models would then generate actionable data for growers, which could then be uh, displayed uh, on the internet uh, so the grower could log in, see a, a, you know, maybe an aerial photograph of their farm, and then have overlay uh, different uh, you know, color-coded sections that would indicate that uh, this is a stressed area and this is not, and then they could work from there. So, um, sorry this went so long, but, um, but I, uh, I do have to um, so, you know, acknowledge the support. Uh, some of these are grants. The, the one in red, that's, that's the important one. The taxpayers of New York and the university that gave continuous funding over 40 years that allowed, allowed this work to happen. Uh, because all these other ones, they last three years and then it stops and you don't have any more funding and, it, and uh, so it's difficult to uh, you know, come up with the types of results that, that we talked about. So. Um, I'd like to thank you for your patience today, but uh, I tried to boil down 40 years as much as possible. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions or whatever you'd like. So, okay. Thank you.